Hey, what's up? We're going to take a second. We're going to talk about uh, basically creating a uh, creating or maintaining a performance science infrastructure, even in the wake of some changing circumstances. So just kind of if you think about what performance science is, you know, it's not the reliance on, on technology. It's, it's certainly not the, the, the singular reliance on on any one system. It's, it's, a, it's a mentality, it's a philosophy of using information in different streams of data uh, to make educated decisions. You know, data can come from a lot of different uh, sources. It can be quantitative in nature from an athlete wearable. It could be uh, quantitative in, na in nature from me collecting metrics from, uh, from, from observation and tallying. It could be uh, qu qualitative in nature. So me uh, um, uh, simply uh, tracking information and just qualitatively assessing an athlete and keeping that information over time. So basically that's the root of everything that we're doing. So when we think about the infrastructure of what performance science is, especially here at Penn State, you know, it doesn't have to change that dramatically, even if things um, may look a little bit different in regard to group size, the way we train, even the way we coach. So I want to kind of run down a couple different things here, especially as it pertains to us. And I want to really think about focusing on the infrastructure. If we think about the infrastructure, everything else will really uh, fall in hand as we move forward. So the first thing I want to think about is uh, just daily operations and logistics. As a coach, uh, in this current state, you know, we want to always uh, model great behaviors and we want to wear our mask at all times. Okay, that's going to really model the good behavior for our athletes and we can help to hold everybody accountable within the organization. Okay, the second thing, when we're thinking about organizing our groups, there are some differences in uh, group size, training organization, maybe venue. Okay, we need to factor that into our plan and understand how that may play a role in how we normally coach. This may also impact the way we do actually coach and provide feedback, how we provide instruction, or what we have on here called management style, how I actually organize my group and how I command the flow of the room or the field or the training environment. Okay, from experience this summer, Think it's um, we in this group think it's really important if your sport relies on a whistle to find a way to practice uh, using your whistle while wearing your mask or gaiter. There are other options out there with electronic whistles and things of that nature, but if you're going to rely on a whistle, a traditional whistle, it's important for you one to be able to practice with that, and two, it's also important for you to be able to practice coaching using your loud voice that you'll need out on the field or court prior to being able to uh, doing that on day one. Okay, the next one, when we actually think about organizing training and loading, it's important to understand the impact the smaller group size may have on uh, the density of training within a session. If I have a normal session that I always do, or let's just say uh, an individual period where I'm working with a certain a uh, group of athletes within the team, and I always do the same drill every single year. If I cut the athletes, let's say in half, and keep the same amount of volume, even if it's a shorter amount of time, there is a risk of having a little bit denser practice and in, uh, intensity inside that period of practice. That's not bad, it's not good, it's just something we need to be aware of and we need to take account of that, okay? We also need to think about uh, how we care, uh, use our exercises. So different things um, with our schedule may be altered slightly. You know, we may be doing things in a different order per se, depending on field or facility availability. We need to think about how one impacts the other. Getting a little bit more into collection of information. Remember, we're trying to establish an infrastructure. It's not the reliance on one system or one set of information. It's creating an infrastructure of information flow so that I can gather it, sort it, and then make a decision based on that. So the next couple that we're going to talk about are wellness surveys, different forms of athlete wearables, force play testing, and nordboard testing. 
when we think about our wellness surveys, many of us have really relied on doing this in person um, through, through a lot of our careers. Not only um, do we ensure that we get all of our athletes checked off at, at that period of time, but it allows us to have an, a one-on-one -on -one engagement with them from time to time on a daily basis. And it also allows us to really get a feel for the, uh, the, the mood of the organization when we do that. Sometimes you can also have um, like a, maybe an iPad at a kiosk when they check in on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe at the nutrition station. Given the nature of what we're going through, that may not be an option. So some other things that we may think about doing is walking, walking around and, and just encouraging athletes to do it on their own device, using Teamworks or text message to send that out, but then working to follow up, like I mentioned, just being always in communication with our athletes. But the days right now of uh, working with a single tab tablet and asking athletes to use the same device, that may not be the best, best method at this point. Okay. Athlete wearables. At this point, I think it would be really, really wonderful if we can empower our athletes to set up and break down their own equipment. Okay, so if athletes are wearing different types of uh, wearables on the field, it could be a, a catapult GPS in the back side of their shirt. Um, let's encourage them with the box set up in the locker room. Let's encourage them to put that in themselves and then following practice, put it back in the charge case. If we're going to be using let's say blast sensors in baseball or softball, let's encourage the athletes to learn how to put them on uh, themselves without having to expend different staff members to be able to do that. Not only does it allow them uh, to become part of the training experience and the monitoring experience, it pushes accountability on them too, and it creates a little bit more ownership in what we're doing. We'd also like to stress that no matter what we want to, if, if it's a wearable and the athletes are coming in contact with it, we want to make sure that we, we clean them thoroughly after every single use. Even if it was just a small amount of time, we wanna make sure we're cleaning that, uh, following every guideline that we've been involved with uh, during, during this return to sport during COVID-19, okay? With force plate testing, consider uh, teaching athletes the jumps at the beginning of the semester, especially if I'm gonna do this often. Okay, so just go through the, the jumps or the, the different types of tests that you may be doing um, on the force plate. Teach them thoroughly one time and then you can basically use feedback and, and corrective feedback through the semester to adjust or, or to give some information if you need to. Would always encourage you, this goes with the Nord board here coming up too, integrate your testing into training as opposed to doing it in isolation. So instead of doing my testing before training or um, at a different scheduled period of time, let's see if we can just integrate it into training. Now understand that, you know, sometimes that may um, kind of change the flow of our training session, but if I'm doing some jumps, it's really easy to just put it near the top of my, to, to top of my training card, um, following some of my warm up and activation exercises before I get into the big strength lifts. I'm still fresh, I'm already warmed up, and I'm really gonna get a good reading there. We wanna avoid doing testing toward the end of the lift, just because you may be in a pre fatigue state at that point. Okay, but early in the lift, when you're already doing some power movements, just put it in there and it'll really help with the flow of everything. You can do the same thing with Nord board. Okay, so the thing um, that you know would think about with the Nord board is just, just integrate it into some of your post chain work. So if you're already doing Nordic curls, let that be one of your sets. If you're already doing some blue hand raises, let that be one of your sets and just integrate it into your training. We'd also encourage you um, if you're a field based sport to Utilize your Nordboard testing on days where you're really not going to sprint after. Uh, you know, just we, we, we want sprinting is very demanding, and we, we want to be able to do that in a, in a, in a pre fatigue state. Okay, so uh, we, we want to try to avoid testing, especially the Nordboard, um, before we sprint. Okay, the next two uh, involve uh, recovery and then just education. And they kind of go hand in hand a little bit as well. So when we think about recovery, um, it's really easy for us to think about isolated tools. Okay, so it's really easy for us to think about the cold tub as a recovery tool or a foam roller, and that's what's gonna help me. But we wanna really reconceptualize this, especially right now when uh, some of our tools may not be available due to the nature of, um, uh, of social distancing. 
So instead of teaching recovery by the way of a tool, consider teaching it from a principles-based perspective. So think about the balance of the central nervous system and the sympathetic or gas pedal and the parasympathetic side, which is like the brake pedal. There's a lot of different ways that I can activate and really become sympathetic pre-training. And there's also ways that I can uh, recover and become more parasympathetic after. Consider teaching that as opposed to tools. And then find, find ways, maybe innovative ways to encourage athletes to build their own recovery tools um, you know, at home so they're always available or if they're traveling. And then finally, this is kind of something that we're always pushing, but just let's work to teach athletes the why behind what we're doing. If we understand the why, everyone in the organization um, has, has buy-in to the why, we're all going to be able to understand the direction we're going and we can take more ownership in that. Always think about the power of digital media. It can form, come in the form of social media, teamwork, even simple text messages or public posting in your facility. But, you know, in, in all, I want to encourage everyone to think about performance science and the use of information, not just as tools. We can gather information in a lot of different ways. Think about it as a way to make better, more educated decisions. In this time that we're in right now, I would encourage everyone to be simple, okay? Find ways to automate flows of information, find ways to automate and empower our athletes during the data collection process, but by all means, be simple, be consistent, and use your information to make great decisions. Thank you guys, hope everybody's doing well. Can't wait to see everybody on campus here soon. Take care.